So, when Molly made Being Blacker in 2018, I think? Came out in 2018. Came out in 2018. We presented it here, we did a kind of premiere. Um, and it was a fantastic event, really cool. Uh, and I remember watching the film and thinking, this, this feels kind of important. Like, all the films we show here are special, but I remember watching it and thinking, it feels like there's something more to this, it's important. And Molly and I were chatting in the green room and she was, she's quite an operator. <laughs> and uh, she got her claws into me and we ended up scheming a little bit to produce this. So this is now, uh, I think it's being released this Friday, so please do go out of your way to tell your friends and family to get hold of one of these. This is a BFI dual format DVD and Blu-ray. Um, also... I why I got my claws into you. No, I'm, I'm going to ask you to do that. Um, the other thing I want to say is, we, if you, um, whilst you're here, if you grab one of these, this is our programme for August. We've got a whole season of reggae on film happening at the moment, so there's loads of cool films playing here. Grab one of these, check out when they're playing, and come back. And it's, uh, it's kind of celebrating reggae's influence on moving image culture. So it's a really cool season. So there's some films and events, and they're running throughout August. Um, the other thing I want to say is that Molly's films, I think all of Molly's work, is going to wind up on our streaming platform, BFI Player, from October. So if you enjoy the film tonight and you come back and see some more things, then in October you can go to BFI Player and you can check out more of Molly's work. So what I'm going to do now um, is, actually before I do, when you're watching this, think of some cool questions to uh, ask Molly and Blacker, who's here. Um, we're going to have a great Q&A that's going to be hosted by Radio 1 Extra DJ Shawnee B, who's over here. Thank you very much, Shawnee. Uh, so I think it's some cool questions, but now I'm going to invite Molly to say a few words about being blacker and sound business. Well, actually, I'm not, because we've got such a short period of time, and we need to <laughs> leave lots of that. The thing about the clause was because of sound business, because the reason I knew blacker was because of a student film I made 43 years ago with Julian Caden and Louisa, who are here. And it was a student film about Jamaican sound systems. So it was pretty crude how it was made. But the subject matter was just, I think it's just really important and formative. And when we were filming, we ran into Shawnee B, and Shawnee sort of endorsed it by explaining the connection between a lot of modern music and what the original sound men had actually done and created. So I'm not going to burble on because I'm so keen we should get on with it, but we're going to show the whole of Being Blacker, and then when Shawnee does the Q&A, hopefully we can touch on some bits of sound business. Um, and because we have some pretty big operators of sound systems in the room, it'd be nice to hear from them. So thank you very much for coming. I think um, 
yeah. if if you come from my community and uh, I see quite a few people that come from the kind of community that we come from, inner city communities, from a black community, I think that we could all agree that after the word being, we could have literally put anybody's name after that word being. Because for mm. me, I just saw my community. I just see what I used to grow up amongst um, day to day. Um, if you're not from our community, welcome to an inner city community like that. And for me, that's what it is. Um, um, you see family, um, you see the, the heartache, you see community, you see all of that. It's, it's a multitude of different experiences for me. And um, Blacker, how did the community take that program after seeing it? Like, it's five years on. I remember we had a conversation after we premiered it here, but it hadn't gone out on terrestrial TV as such. Mm -hmm. How did the community take it after it was aired? Were they happy? Were they sad? Did they, did they look at you in any way? Well, uh, yeah, good evening, everyone. Um, yeah, I think they, they took it in because a lot of people, like you said, they could see themselves in that position mm -hmm. and some people even worse even though at, you know some people think their burden is the heaviest but when you take a stock that next man have a bigger problem than you so i think a lot of people and a, a lot of recognition for that documentary because as a sound system operator a man who played the sound everyone's looking for a sound looking for music mm -hmm. but when they saw this it was like a different thing people were kind of, some of us shocked. I think that's one of the things for me, even watching it now, when I met Blacker, it was like mid nineties, I think I met you when I mm. first come to your record shop, on Cold Harbor Lane, Blacker Dread Music Store, and I'm going in there as a young kid selling records to Blacker Dread. This character that I've heard for so many years playing a sound system by the name of Coxon, and it was a notorious sound system as well. It was a well feared sound system as well. I'm sure that you guys would agree with me. Yeah, well, I mean. <laughs> so to be able to walk into a, a place like that and meet Blacker Dread and at this notorious sound system operator, but then to be able to watch this program and to see the person Blacker Dread. You know what I'm saying? Not the, the sound system operator, the producer, or this notorious figure that is known out in the streets. Like, how, how was it for you for people to see you in that manner, Blacker? Scary. <laughs> <laughs> because it's, it's a truth, isn't it? So, mm. they, um, so I have to say thank you to Molly anyway, because how we did it, there was no script. We just, Molly just kept flaming and flaming and the more she flamed, it, it's like, me get more warmer to her. So it, 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 it just happened. And everything organic, nothing, nothing made up. There's no double takes. If if Molly said to me, say, oh, I like what you just said, let me say it again. I said, no, Molly, anything will pass, pass. Simple. If it pass, it pass. Molly, how was it for you making this film? Because when I watch this, I see a certain level of respect, a certain level of trust as well because you're hearing stories that many of us would never have ever heard these stories to. No, it, and it's true, and because I'd met Blacker and met Tali all those years ago, but that film was purely about sound system, what I realised is how ignorant I was all those years back about people's lives. Mm. So that was the great privilege, and I think it's really brave and really generous, especially when people are going through a rough time to let somebody in, because the first film was a celebration Mm -hmm. something that was hard enough to get in but this one I think that you were just incredibly I don't know why you did it I still don't quite know um, what was the relationship between you and Blacker for that amount of time that you had filmed like the first documentary the sound system business? we didn't really see each other did we I came to the shop once with my children back again in 2012 and then when I heard your mum had died that's mm. when we decided to film. Yeah, yeah. I actually rang Molly up and said to her, you know, Miss Molly, could you come and film Mum's funeral for me? Because, you know, mm. you're the best person I know. Is that when you realised that there was a deeper character behind Blacker? The reason why I say that is because when my mother passed, yeah. um, somebody that used to work with or somebody that worked with me at One Extra, they came to my mum's setup yeah. and to the night night, and when they left, they walked away and pulled me, and it goes, now I know who Shorty B is. Because oh, yeah. there was 200 people out on the block who was yeah. eating fish, hard oil bread, celebrating life. It's not normal. Yeah. Is that where you discovered 
it was a really big thing because to film a funeral when you're wanted there is a very different thing from when you're making a documentary and that was a very brilliant start for me mm -hmm. because you know it was an enormous event but people wanted it filming there was no question about what's she doing here um, and then thanks to Naptali, whose car I got in, that began, began to sort of unfold. Because <laughs> I never used to deal with him back in Coxon days. I was far too scared. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think Naptali was one of the stars of this programme. Can we agree? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. His well-spoken manner and... How <laughs> that Tali from being a black yeah, rich man, <laughs> being this 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 character out of the streets in the seventies and eighties, how do you sound like that? <laughs> like like so honestly, <laughs> as as I've explained, it, it's just being around people, and the life that I lived from earlier on in life that caused me to have this kind of, you know, way of speaking. I just I read a lot of books read a lot of books and listened to a lot of news and documentaries and stuff and I just picked up picked it picked up the lingo and decided to, well you know it suits me to speak where I speak amongst people who speak like that and when I'm amongst my own I can change back into speaking that way is it a form of code switching what switch Code switching. Code switching. Yeah, switching. Because as black people in this country, we have to do a lot of switching. When we're amongst our own, we relax into the way that we talk and we're not needing a subtitle. Yeah, that's not part of it. That, that, then, that is part of it. That is part of it. But, you know, it, it, it helps and it works. It works if you're with, you know, European people, you know, European people speak a certain way and they... I think accept you more if you speak like them and they can understand more what you're saying or how. Who is the real Naptali then? Any one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, Shani, let me tell you something, right? I'm gonna tell you like this, right? When I joined Cox and Sound in the seventies, yeah. Christ. This <laughs> this guy here, yeah, I thought he was a big man. I swear, Tony. <laughs> I thought this brother, I didn't know we were born the same year. Because he was like the paymaster. He used to collect the money, yeah? And then he would decide, in his own infinite wisdom, who was going to get paid. So if he didn't like you, he didn't get paid. This guy was, it was scary. I don't know what to say. <laughs> I want to move on to the sound system um, documentary and stuff. Because I think that that's the catalyst for everything yeah. where we are right now. Yeah. Um, but I do want to ask, Blacker, what would you want people, or what did you want people to take away from this documentary? Reality, reality of life, you know. I want people to take that it ain't all a bed of roses. And if you believe the hype in the media, then you think that it's, it's an easy road. Mm -hmm. But it's not an easy road, it's a rough, rough road wherever you reach you know what i mean some people don't reach no way you know? but you still have to go on that that journey and it's it, it not easy it's not easy sean it it's rough because you know even when i was going to school back in the day if it wasn't for my teacher mr jenkins rest in peace yeah that man took me up in his wings and he said to me martin don't be scared don't don't worry about them just learn so I have a lot to thank that brother for. Natali, yes. yourself? Oh, sounds the, the sound system thing. No, no, what would you want people to take oh. away from this documentary? Um, after, especially for yourself, because you were so honest. Yes. Like, super, uh, super, super duper honest, I showing your war scars and all the rest of it. Like. Yeah, life can throw up a lot of things for you as you go along the road. And sometimes you go down a wrong road, but you can recover from that you know you can recover. have belief in yourself and have good people around you if you have good people around you are willing to tell you the truth no matter what it is thank you tell them the thank truth <laughs> <laughs> tell them the truth and what is right and what is wrong yeah and that helps you especially later on in life when i mean not everybody can do the same thing from the beginning of life to the ending of life so there comes a time in life when you decide to, well, you know, you 
can't fucking do this anymore. Excuse mm. me. You can't do this no more. Yeah. So you have to just be sensible, listen to good advice, and just do the right thing. And have you been able to maintain that that yes. new path that you're on? Yes. Working and everything. Yes. You're good, you're nice. things, life has got better. Good. Life has got better, you know. And I'm still here, you know. Largely because of. Well, mm. you yeah, give thanks to my lady, G, lady Jackie B over there. She's got me on the straight path. Big up the She's got me, and, and that is a beautiful set. Because I did want to ask um, about your sister, because your sister seemed to have taken that matriarch role within the family and definitely looked after you. Yeah. I hope you look after her. Like, yeah, man. She's how, a is, big how, sister. Is, how is big sister doing? Yeah, she man, she's a big blessed. sister. You know, I have two big sisters. Jean is here. June couldn't come because she's um, going to see her daughter in Hastings. Mm -hmm. But yeah, my sisters, they, they keep me on the straight and narrow and I respect them to the max. I listen to them when it's necessary. <laughs> <laughs> well, she can still conk me and I have to accept it. <laughs> and, and your son, is it Jamal? Yeah? Jamal, yeah, he's, he he's doing, doing excellent. He's 19 last week, Sunday. And um, he's doing excellent. He done. He passed all his exams. Wow. He was in the class of 2015. Yeah. Is, he, is he still in Jamaica as well? Yeah. Yeah? He didn't want to come. I tried to bring him up to come here. He wants to stay in Jamaica. He said, Dad, what am I going to do in England? Mm -hmm. Come on, Dad. I don't even have a coat. I haven't, I haven't worn a coat since I was seven years old. Where am I going to get a coat from? Uh, and again, like black parents, like this may sound strange to some of you guys, but my son and I'm sure other children have gone through the same madness at school simply for the sake of understanding. Mm. And I've had to go into my son's school many times and they'd be like, oh, the manner that he talks, yeah, but the manner that we talk at home, this is the way that we talk at home. So mm. he's coming into a school with his culture. How about you adapting and learning? How about you putting yourself into an uncomfortable position? And they, that, the responses that I received was, but this is not the society that they're going out to. I work on a radio station where there was a white guy that was talking more black than me and was mm. more successful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And when I said that to them, they had to kind of check themselves really, really fast. So there's a lot of stories in this documentary right here that I don't want people to kind of look at on a very surface level. Like, you really have to kind of dig deep into. And I want to dig deep into, um, you still iron your socks? Yeah. <laughs> Why would you want to dig deep into that? Ah, that's funny. <laughs> you still iron your socks? Yeah, yeah man, still iron your socks. Yeah, man, everything iron, man. I just like to see them iron. I just like to it's see. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> is, is that a discipline that your mom kind of set into? Yeah, but listen. Even as young black men, uh, again, our mothers taught us so much. Yeah, to wash, cook, clean, and look Mum used to do all my washing for me. Every single thing. And when I got my socks, they were crisp and they looked so neat and tidy. So I'm saying, Mum, yeah, she said, well, your socks must iron because they feel more comfortable. <laughs> now, one of the things that was mentioned in the intro about this week of celebrating reggae and culture of the music is that we're going to do it this week. But no, it's also because it's the 60th year of Jamaica independence. Yeah. Yeah. And your mum come to England in 1962. Yeah. Did it say the year of independence? Yeah. That's just crazy. Yeah. And then to know your musical journey. When did your musical journey start? Actually, before we go there, by a show of hands, how many people understand the concept of what a sound system is? Right, so that's kind of less than half of the room in there. Yeah. Could we show a clip of what sound system is? Or do you want to explain what sound system before is? Before you say that, excuse me, sure, before you, Fine. I have to acknowledge mm -hmm. my brethren, who is one of the godfathers of us all here. Mm -hmm. yeah? Father. The, well, father. Festus. Festus. Who's going to bring Festus into Festus the conversation? But, we have it, but you're going into the uh, music. We're going too, into the music. So we too. have to acknowledge Father Festus. All right. First us, I'm blacker, but yeah. I'm just a young student of this sound system thing. Yeah. You can explain what a sound system is, and then we could go into clip number five. Yeah, well, a sound system is basically, um, English people then would call it a disco. So you can imagine a disco like 50 times bigger than a normal disco, <laughs> yeah? with bass amplifiers that, that if you don't know what you're doing, it'll blow you out, mm. out of the room. So that's, that's what we grew up to. And I always remember my dad going to Jamaica 1970 
and coming back with um my boy the Eric Donaldson Cherry O Baby. Baby. And I think he bought four copies of it. And I still got one of the copies now. Wow. And then my uncle upstairs took one. I don't know what happened to the other two. But that song, I just kept on playing and I couldn't stop. And then Keith upstairs had a sound. So sometimes on a Sunday, when they were playing dominoes and drinking their long life beer, and he got drunk, he would say, come here boy, come, <laughs> come put on two records for me. So he used to put the records on the side and say, put them on the turntable. And like, oh my gosh. My fingers are like, oh. And, what you doing, boy? Put them on good. All right, boss. So that's, how, that's my teaching. So when I got the opportunity, as a 15-year-old, um, Coxon was playing in Brixton at a place called Con, and I got my opportunity to like start to go around Coxon. It was like a different world. It was a massive, it was just so, it was just so wicked. So many things was happening. You couldn't, you couldn't, you, you'd have to live it to actually believe. It's almost impossible to try and explain it, surely. Mm. Because it, there was people all over the place, people, hundreds, thousands of people. We went to dances where there was like five, ten thousand people. We even played on Clapham Common with wow. 300,000 people. So we're talking about major entertainment. And there was nothing for black people, hardly any clubs, anything. So we had to make our own entertainment. You know, heard of partners, people used to throw partners together, although it's illegal in England. And everybody just make sure, say, people just join in unity. Do you unity. understand what a partner is? No. Uh, Do you uh, want to explain what a partner is? A partner is a thing that, okay, so everyone in this room throws five pounds. Say you have a banker, and that banker collects five pounds. Every week. Every week. So say, this week is yours, so you get everyone's five pounds, and you can go and do something with it. You do it the next week, and everybody gets so it goes right it's round. Like a pyramid scheme, yeah, so a everybody gets a share. So although you might not have that six hundred pound one time, when you get your partner draw, the amount of things that you can do with that six hundred pound is amazing. So that was the structure that we grew up and trying to help one another. It, it was a magnificent thing. Again, it's part of our community. I'm sure every black person here would put up their hand and say if they was a part of a partner <laughs> yeah a mother or somebody yeah, was part to be a part of a partner yeah um can we play clip number five um from the clips please for the sound system um so that clip is going to show the sound system is being set up in is it brixton town hall there we go have we got that clip yes okay clip number five 17th january 1981 Young Lionel are now leaving for the National Sounds Arena, Brixton Town Hall, where Sir Coxon are even now arriving. There's no prize or come for this dance. It is just the crowd who will judge. The mighty Jashaka, spiritual dog warrior from the southeast London. London's A1 sound, Sir Coxon, the strong tower, and also the hall with these two high-ranking dub machines from the south, sound called Stereograph, and the younger one of today, Young Lion. One, one, fist in my check, you know? One, two, three, that's it. My check, fist in one, you know? Like a national, you know? Oh, still it, still it. My check, one, like a national. One, one, fist in one. Now, why I thought it was important to show that clip is because 
if we join the dots of where music is, especially black music is right now in the UK, and a lot of people say that that was the source of where it came from. When you see the likes of, and I've spoke about it in the documentary, the likes of Stormzy or Fredo or any of these new kids that are out doing like rap music or grind music or drill music, this is what it came from. The originally black British young guys making music mm. for themselves. It was for your own entertainment. Yeah, yeah, man. Yeah. You, t you tell me and tell me about that time, Blacker. Yeah, well, we used to like, all right. Um, I started producing in 1983 actually because I'm um, the great sugar miner, rest in peace. He looked at me one day and said, um, Blacker, you know, you've got good timing. You've got a lot, um, a lot of things going for you. Um, he said, producing is about knowing the tempo, knowing what people like and stuff like that. So we just tried to recreate what we saw in the dances. So when people dance, mm -hmm. you look at all them dance and say, oh, okay, I'm going to make a beat that they can dance like this. So we had all different gully banking, skanking, you have walk and skank, you have all kind of different dance, rubber dub, you have all roots, dub, everything. So we made the music to accommodate the people and the pressure and the suffering that they were going through. Also, we made music for the love that they were going through. And, you know, made music for girls, because if you have music for women, you know that man, man comes. Come. Yeah, so <laughs> ABC. How do you feel knowing where sound system culture is now in 2022? Um, if you look at festivals, sound system has to be a massive part of that. Even on Radio 1, there's a show called The Sound System Show. Do you think that these people understand the true essence of what sound system is and what it brought to um, British culture, music culture? I think they have, to, they, they have to get it from the grassroots. So a documentary like Sound Business is like a way in. Because even when Molly was doing it back then, Molly, <laughs> she, she was under a lot of pressure. This little white girl in a dance with beer black people and she's got her lights on. People used to stop her from filming all the time. So it was hard for her to do it. And it's only now, like 40 years later, I always say to myself, I wish we had taken Molly in and just yeah. let her do what I let her do then, back then. Yeah. Because there's, no, there's, there's nothing like that out there for mm. anyone to see where it actually came from. It's a funny film, actually, because at the time this film came out, it was the Brixton riots, and I was literally obsessively filming Festus cutting dubs, Young Lion building a bass speaker. It was a very, very technical film. I think the focus, that's what, but maybe that's its strength now, that it literally is about the business of running a sound system. What, what made you want to do it, Molly? Because na nowadays I can understand if a corporate wanted to come in or somebody from outside the culture wanted to come in because you can see so much influence um, within the music that somebody would want to dig deeper. But in 1980, like... Actually, it was 79, and Julian and Louisa, who I made it with, they were, we were at the London College of Printing. Do you remember why we made it? I was just obsessed. Yeah, it was a what? It was a project. <laughs> Low budget. <laughs> but I think it's also, I'd really love to... Um, if those first couple of clips, because we have Festus here, who mm -hmm. is the original big selector of Cox and Sound. Wow, son of Festus, the people are seeing them out. Yeah, yeah, boss, boss. I'd like us to play a clip that shows the magic of what Festus does. And I just want to kind of explain what this clip is about, first of all. Um, if you listen to EDM music or drum and bass or anything that has like a big um, atmospheric ramp up to it and then the bass line drops and it hits and you see the crowd go like ridiculously crazy, what, what you have to understand that what you are watching stems from this right here. It stems from the studios in Jamaica. It stems from producers and engineers um, experimenting with um, electrics to work out how to filter stuff and to like but the clip itself you will be able to see where Festus is manipulating the sound changing the sound and what used to happen in a lot of these dances I'm black blacker you can tell me if I'm right or wrong that 
the crowd will be in an event and there will be no bass line that is playing. But the minute that the operator yeah. chips in the bass line and yeah. then the room starts Bang. to shake, Bang. you see the response. And I've been one of those patrons in our dance that when you feel that bass line hits you, and I think that that has been taken from this music and been put into modern day music. But we'll be able to see it from this clip. Can we play clip number one, please? Is do me or do me number two? Oh, number two, my apology, playing. my yes. apology. Number Batu. I need to lower this no. To be the A1 sound depends not only on the exclusive music featured, but also on how the sound is played. No, no, it's only up when it's cut down. In yeah. case you when it's cut down, so that's the first stuff. Like I put all my money, I've taken my chances on a bit of a sound when it's cut down. It, it's just the way he plays, you know, he just makes you stand up and watch him, right? First, because I was just looking, saying, "Oh, the great fist, you know, the great fist, this one, cocks and so on," you know. The operator knows his music to the extent he can use his split, treble and the bass amplifiers to conduct instruments in and out of the music as he feels. That was a piano just that way that was a piano I just brought up in. I knew it was coming. And the, you, you want to play that clip as well? Let's play that clip well, as well. It might be quite funny just from a bass point of view. The <laughs> film is with Copson, who are a big sound, but also a, a younger sound who are sort of working to try and get into the league. And they build a bass bin in their quite small flat and then they test it out. So this is just, it's only about 30 seconds. It's, it's, so it's clip number four, I think. If you've ever been next door to a rumbling um, party next door, that is probably um, what was going on. Um, Festus, can we get a mic to Festus? Does Festus want to come and oh, you want to come and oh, take a seat, Festus? Yeah, Yo. Uh, yeah, man. I think what's important to note is that people like these guys and others in the industry from the 70s, 60s, 70s and coming right up, they were inventors geniuses, like brilliant people. Because in 2022, companies like Pioneer, Serato, Techniques, you name it, they all implement this kind of technology into their equipment today. Um, like one of the leading mixers out right now is like a Pioneer mixer. And they have something on it called a kill switch where you can filter out the baseline or cut out the baseline. These are all things that these guys were pioneering in the 70s and the 80s having sound effects, like even on one of the clips that, um, is it Mr. A? I invented sound effects. Speak to me, <laughs> oh, speak, right. speak to me. So if you ever heard a mix and, and you heard ear horns and sound effects going off, you could blame him. <laughs> and 
I mean, to do something that black can never tell you. Know. It's a blacker. Levi Roots didn't come to me and said, Festus, no, I'm come from Coxo Sound. God, make it happen. I was loading my van to go to country. Here comes Black Adred and Levi Roots walking by. And I said, come here. <laughs> Help me lift up this box. So you was playing the sound system already prior to Coxon? I used to play Matador sound before that, but this time I meet Blacker for the first time in my life. His mother sent him to shop <laughs> to buy goods, and I take him off and him root to help me lift box. <laughs> That's how I met Black and Levi Roots. When you when you look at everything that's going on in music circles, as in sound system and seeing the technology and how it's moving, how do you feel about this festival? Well, I, I'm glad I take part in it because when I came into this sound system business, we were all playing ceramic in the music beat that was mono. So you couldn't actually turn off the bass independently now the treble independently until 1975. King Tubby's husband, Ruddock of Jamaica, bring back that old concept that was in already, but they threw it out. Said it was no good. The bass cut off. That was the first thing they bring in. But they threw it out and bring in like you buy a stereo in the shop. You can't turn off the bass, everything. Did it until Cox in the UK also changed the concept. Toby changed in Jamaica, Cox changed back in the UK because it was a thing of the past which they threw out, say it was no good. But right, Toby's so. and I realized that we needed something. Yeah, so what, this what? is all the barn, this is all bass and treble. Born. And it's silly, you know. So what Festus is really saying, all right, so um, sound systems didn't have EQs back then. Those things weren't invented. They might have been invented, but not for the sound system. So actually what they were playing, when he mono. says ceramic, mono. it's like it's if mono. you're playing just, you got a stereo and you're just playing, everything's playing through one speaker mm. and there's nothing playing on that side. So back then, that's how it used to play. But then they, they brought it forward now. So you had the left and you had the right. And what, what they did, instead of splitting it left and right, they split it from the top to the middle to the bottom. So that's that's how we were able to do that. So Festus was like the pioneer. Um, he went to our, our builder and asked him, could you make this? So Mr. Errol Pettigrew, the man, I mean, he's in the sound system documentary. He made it possible for us to be able to take out the bass, take out the mid-range and take out the tops, whichever part you want, even big, big companies that, that make um, EQs, they used to come to us and say, well, what is it that you want? What is it that you do? And when we showed them, they, they were amazed. They said, well, it's not made to do that. I said, that's why we use it, because it's not made to do that. That's why we use it to do that. Do you think this music, do you think People like yourself, Naptali, Festus, get the just deserve respect for the kind of things that you have brought to the industry. I, I, no, respect. I think in the community, yeah, yeah, a lot of people in the community do respect us. Um, some sound systems won't because the beat no them get. Because in, in, in a sound system, it's like a football match, yeah? So you got your crowd and, and they vote for you. So Coxon was so popular, we had most of the crowd all the time. So when we played out, it was like, if you say a show of hands then, to say who is the best sound, it was about shouting. So people would shout and say, yeah, you play the record. They would shout and say, this sound is the baddest sound. So, but I wanted to talk about how Festus, he used to EQ the sound. Well, he, it, it was amazing. I was, I, I was perplexed by it. They used to make the sound 
make the record. So when you went back home and you played that same record, <laughs> you'd say, but how comes my record ain't playing like that? <laughs> I want I want my record to sound like how Festus is playing it. It just it just wouldn't happen. How did you learn all this stuff, Festus? Or is it just listening to the music? Yeah, my born and grew up Jamaica and my brother, I was eight year old. My brother had a son, he was 17 years old. So the love for we made it up for it, you know. See the dance all this up. And I have some live. So you know, I said, Count Nick, Prince Buster, the first voice of the people, Strude one, every sound come this up. So me and my brother sleep as a little boy, eight year old yeah, sound and lick me in a man. Straight. <laughs> every night, every weekend. You understand? I get beaten for God, Prince Buster, you know, just before me left Jamaica 1964, you know. Buster playing on my ear, I'm a say, boy. <laughs> I forgot that don't say no, I can't miss me. I'm going to get beat when I come back, but I'm <laughs> glad I come back. <laughs> you understand? I want you guys to um, line up any questions that you may have. I just want to ask each of you, um, without music, without sound system, but let's be fair, I think we're sitting here today because of the success of Cops yes. and the success of your um, production, Black Art. Where do you think that you would be without the music today? Dead are prison. <laughs> yeah. We're gonna get honest here. Yeah. <laughs> Simple. Dead are prison, Shani. There was nothing else. I didn't leave school with any 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 academic stuff. I didn't want to work. I actually did. No, let me tell the truth. I worked at Sunlight Laundry. I went to work at eight o'clock in the morning. I got the sack by eleven. <laughs> yeah. I worked in Kentucky in Brixton and I got I was there for half a day because the guy wanted me to take chips that had fallen on the floor to put in the fryer. I said I'm not selling no black people this. Are you crazy? You think I could you think I could sell this to people? So I threw everything away. I just threw it all in the dustbin and walked out. So I worked twice and I never even got paid. So why am I not gonna work again? I came here to be a doctor. You came to be a doctor? Yes. And sound system <laughs> pulled me away. Oh my, a doctor for real? Yes. Wow. So my that two time. sisters are nurse. I was supposed to be the doctor. But the sound system grabbed me up from early at 14, going to school and playing sound system at the same time. At 14, I was the biggest selector in England. And it was going that to school. age when you were playing the sound? Yes. And still going to school. Still going to school. Amazing. Bob Marley danced to me. Yeah. I played at six, seven, eight, nine Bob Marley shows. Can you not notice I'm just quiet when Festus is talking? Yeah. I've, heard, I've heard about yeah. Festus for so many fine. years, but yeah. like, I've never it. heard these stories like I this. met Bob Marley, yeah? When I met Bob, it was at a Cox and Dance. Bob used to, and this is, you can, this is this is the real honest truth. He used to go to Cox, and there was a little short man standing in the corner, and he'd bring a a, a, a pre-cut disc, what we call a dub plate now, but it was a it, it was a pre-release, something that you could listen just to listen, and he would bring it to the dance, and he would give it to like Festus, and say, play this for me, let me hear. So Festus would play it. And he would say, yeah, I like this one. And, and he'd go and finish the song. But he would give it to him. So we was a sound that was playing even because Bob Marley's got massive when he finished, when he went away, he, when he passed on, innit? But he was like, like how we were. We were just bridging, we were just friends. King yeah. Kirege was right around us. Yeah. King Kirege England. came to me, listen to me, leave, go home and write that song. King wow, Kirege. Down in the 20s. Yeah, because we were playing in <laughs> Carnaby Street in the West End then. So much history. Natali. Yeah. The sound. I I grew up listening to Joe Creed's song. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then Joe Creed decided to well, he want to go home. That They was playing down in um the Swan at the time. Mm -hmm. And that's where my you, well it start from before but when my adult you could have said mm -hmm. you know start from this one then juke go home and 
there was no other choice for me but to come to Cox and Sound. Them time the, the sound of player twenties and these places. Where's twenties? Play not the road in twenties. Now I've got you. Seven years. I played at the road in twenties. Seven years straight. Seven nights a week. Three hundred and sixty-five days a year. A year, sorry. Three hundred and sixty-five days make one year, you know. Seven times three hundred and sixty-five is how much? That's how much days I played non-stop. That's where I stayed. And every Friday night for that seven years, every Friday night is brand new music. Every Friday. Well, that's one thing I know that. I, that. I, I, I know that. I can make testament to that because. That's yeah. where I was as a little young youth. So none of these selectors like can't tap my thing, man. My thing, tap a tap. Wasn't able to get in. So what, what, time. what you're seeing right now is a lot of sound system <laughs> bravado. Yeah. 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 That's, yeah. That's, yeah. What, that's what happens with DJs. Um, yeah. Are we going to take any questions from the audience? We've got some. We've got one, one question. So it's got to be a great question. One great question. Does it have to be a question? Can I just? Oh, it is on. Sorry, yeah. I've just got a big mouth then. Um, <laughs> Blacker, sorry. I don't know how to say this. I got very emotional at the beginning of the documentary. So I did knew... I. <laughs> yes. Now, what it is, I'm going to explain. Um, I went to evangelical church between the age of 7 and 11. And your mum was one of the women who used to teach us the scriptures. Okay? So, I know Pamela, Carol and some other members of your family. But then generationally, you know some of my family who were your age group as well, who came to Coxon, but they used to go to Taurus as well. They were a bit naughty. They didn't just stick to one sound. And I starred in a film that was not about Brixton, but it included sound system called Baby Mother. So okay, God bless yeah, you. Right, I just wanted yeah. to say that to you. Respect, love the documentary. We'll post it, hope that everyone else in here will use their social media to do the same. Thank All right, you. and your mum was an amazing woman. No. I hated church in the end, so I broke <laughs> up with it. <laughs> yeah, but thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. Okay. I went through that teaching as well because I had to go to church. Yeah. <laughs> every Sunday. Yeah. <laughs> Religiously. Exactly. The white band would come and get me with my white socks and my shiny shoes. <laughs> so there you go. All right, and look at us now. And I'm yeah, still in Brixton still, too. Yeah. All right, but I had no idea when I came here. I didn't realise you were. I'm Martin, I'm so sorry. Okay, no All problem. Right. Condolences. Love respect. Peace. Yeah, Peace. All right. Yeah, I'm gonna go now. Hungry like. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. Before we leave, I just want to say that um, I think what is on display here is a different side of the black community. What you have witnessed on the screen as well yeah. is a different side of the black community. I think what we see on in the mainstream right now is of young black Britain, and that could be slightly worrying a lot of the times when there's so much culture, so much tradition, so much community, so much family, so much love that is on show, that even if some of these younger kids will be able to see this a lot more, they will understand where they're coming from and how to act out into the community mm. differently as well. So I just want to say thank you to Blacker, Natali, and to Festus and Molly. And give thanks to the people who come out and support it and have been supporting it. And give thanks to the people who support the reggae because without the reggae, a lot of people in England wouldn't have no careers or no life or no money or nothing, you know? And, 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 and to be a part of, of that journey growing up, it's been wonderful. And, and every day I walk in Brixton or anywhere in England, I've even been walking in America, and I see a man walking with a Black and Dread record bag. Mm. And I had to run across the platform and say, where did you get that bag? Mm -hmm. He said, I bought some records in Brixton at the record shop called Black and Dread. And I said, wow, I've been to that record shop before. He said, yeah, do you know what? They're so nice in that shop. And I, and I can feel my brains going, thank you, thank you. So I said to them, actually, I am Black and Dread. And the guy he just gave me the biggest hug in the whole wide world, and he said, oh my gosh. And he was calling, do you know this guy's famous? 
Yeah. He is so I said, no, no, please. please, please. <laughs> we've, had, we've also got some people in Australia yeah. who knows of Black Dread. They've even come over back to the shop time after time when he's at the mm -hmm. shop. From even in way down there, and, you know, down there in Australia, they know about Black Dread. Yeah, because we look after people. Yeah. And I have to just say before you go, I was on Cold Arb the other day, and it's not the same. No, uh, no. Street bricks, them bruv. Trust me, I don't know what the hell is going on over there, but they should have left it with a the man then. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I'm gonna say this. Um, I saw. I'll, I know I'm gonna finish now, but um, I'm, I'm gonna say this. Um, Sunday gone. I used to keep a thing called a Brixton Splash, and Sunday gone, we had like 20,000, 30, 40,000 people, and Sunday gone would have been when we kept it. Mm. And I walked around Brixton on Saturday and Sunday, and what I noticed was they kept like 50 small things using the same budget that we used to get 40,000 people. They kept 50 small things. When you go to the council and you say to them, so what's going on? They say, but look, the people are enjoying themselves. <laughs> There's like five people over there, 10 in that corner. So it may be like 300 people um, when we was getting 40,000. They Ticket boxes. Yeah, ticket, ticket boxes, boxes. Ticket yeah. boxes. Yeah. Yeah. So the gentrification is on. So the new talk in Brixton now, you may not know, but I'm going to let you know now. They've taken the B from Brixton and put a Y, a, a W, and it's now called Rixton. <laughs> Listen, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Give it up for Blackheart, Festus, Natali, and Molly as well. And big up to BFI as well for hosting this. Thank you very much. Yes, big up to BFI, guys. You know what you're saying. Nice. Well done, Tom and the crew.